Good job, Judy, extending that out for me in time to get up here. Um, we had a little extra time getting the live stream going. So we are going, so welcome at home if you're watching from there, and welcome everyone's here. So I'll say good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see you all and to hear you all here today. So um, only a few announcements today. Again, we're not passing um, the plates uh, for giving, so those are out at the welcome desk. You can drop them in there on your way in or out. Um, we are going to start, uh, beginning of August, we're going to start our communion service again. So first weekend in August, um, we're going to be taking precautions and be doing it in uh, the safest manner that uh, we can, but the elders met and decided, yes, we should start communion again. So first week of August, we'll be doing that again here. If you're going to be at home doing it, we'll just ask you to have your elements ready and you can partake at home with us as we uh, do that service. So looking forward to doing that, the Lord's table again together. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, next Saturday morning, the youth group is going on a sunrise hike. And when I say sunrise, I mean sunrise. I'm going to be leaving at 4.30 in the morning, I believe, from the church here. So um, should be a great time. We're going to get up there um, early so that we can see the sunrise, have a, have a devotional there, and then uh, I believe the... Pancakes are in order afterwards. I think it's IHOP after the hike that morning. So 4.30 morning, contact Carla or any of the youth leaders if you'd like to attend that. Okay. I'm going to ask Patty to come on up at this time as she has a message for us this morning. Good morning. Um, we have a special missions moment this morning. Um, it's a video that features in one project on the other side of the world the combined work of two of the mission organizations that we support. On February 28th this year, Memorial Christian Hospital in Malungat, Bangladesh, celebrated the opening of a new state-of-the-art four-story medical facility. The hospital was funded in part by Samaritan's Purse, and that's an organization that ECC has supported for a very long time. For nearly four decades, Samaritan's Purse has partnered with this hospital, sending volunteer surgeons on service trips beginning in 1981. Now, this is the same hospital where our young missionary, Teresa Vanderford, has been serving as a nurse for the past several years. Well, the mission committee thought that you would like to see the new facility that Teresa has been asking us to pray for and to see some of the work being done there. The patients that occupy the beds in this hospital represent diverse ethnicities and religions. Not only do they desperately need compassionate medical care, but also to learn about the unconditional love of the Lord Jesus. ECC is helping to provi provide both these needs through these mission organizations we support. Dwayne? Truly amazing work going on in some really tough places. So um, just uplifting to see that going and the people they're reaching. So continue prayers for all of them, certainly. I'll have you guys rise with me at this time as we read from God's holy word. And uh, you have to look up now because I see people up here. So it's awesome. We'll be reading from 1 Peter 2, 1 through 5 today in God's word. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up in salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is a reading of God's holy word. Let us pray this morning for our service. Dear Heavenly Father, um, what a tall, tall order we read in this passage today. To put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Tall order indeed. 
So, Father, we come to you today broken. We desperately need your wisdom and discernment in our words, in our actions, in our lives. So, Father, help us be courageous enough to face our own fears, prejudices, and misconceptions. Father, reveal to us what is hidden and keep us and help us learn to love people and love one another. Father, give us ears to hear, eyes to see. Help us be a light in a dark place, in a dark world. Help us bring unity, healing, forgiveness to our community. Father, we know we can only accomplish this through Jesus. Help us be living stones being built up as a spiritual house that is made acceptable to you through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll remain standing as we worship the Lord this morning. Reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls of costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come to this passage this morning, it is profoundly controversial these days, and so we ask for the guidance, the help of your Holy Spirit to teach us what we need to know to live a godly life in an ungodly world so that we would show you forth in all your glory. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and if you haven't already, please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm guessing that uh, we have had some squirming going on as we read that passage this morning. That's because we've been victimized by a culture that is far more interested in political correctness than they are in God's wisdom. When we see the words woman and submissive in the same sentence, it's anathema in our culture. But the truth is that we've turned one of God's great gifts into a dirty word. And this passage gives us the opportunity to reclaim our Christian heritage, and I certainly hope we'll do that today. I don't know where all of you stand on this issue. I hope if you're different than what we've read that you'll at least listen as we go through this and, uh, and have another week of it next week, but I think we'll see that God has reasons for what he does. Society has been aided in coming to its conclusions by genuine abuses over time, right? We all know that. Uh, in, a, in, in a very general way, in a, in, in, just to show how pervasive this was. Any of you who watched the uh, Downton Abbey series on PBS will remember that the eldest daughter of the Earl of Grantham could not inherit his estate because she was a woman. And so for that reason, she was not able to do that. She had grown up in that culture when she defended her sister's right to go to a women's rights meeting, she said this, well, Sybil is entitled to her opinion, to which her grandmother, the dowager countess, replied, no, she is not until she is married. And then her husband will tell her what her opinions are. Well, you can imagine there would be a reaction to that kind of, a rightful reaction to that kind of thought process, which is where culture had led us. That backlash certainly arrived in spades with the feminist movement, which led to many changes which were for the good. 
corrected many faults which were out there, but eventually led to excesses in other ways which have pulled the rug out, out from under the stability of our culture. And too often the church has been taken captive by culture, adopting a, an agenda of gender neutrality at the cost of denying God's clear instruction. Beloved, despite what you may have heard or despite what you may have read or whatever else, I must tell you there is nothing difficult to understand about this passage of Scripture and others like it in the Bible. It's crystal clear. For 2,000 years, the interpretation was not in question nor in doubt. Professor Bob Yarborough, who teaches at Trinity Evangelical Seminary, did a study a few years ago of thousands of documents writing on the subject of submission over the years, came to the conclusion that there was, until 1969, there was no revisionist view on this. That's when it first came into vogue and began to deny the idea of submission. Since then, there's been, of course, a flood tide of literature of that sort that has appeared in academic literature having to do with theology following the feminist movement of the 1960s, denying the concept of submission. Yarbrough says that that feminist influence on our understanding of Scripture is indebted significantly to the prevailing social climate rather than to the biblical text. Another theologian, Harold O.J. Brown, observes when opinions suddenly undergo dramatic alteration, although nothing new has been discovered, and the only thing that has dramatically changed is the spirit of the age, then one must conclude that the spirit has had an important role to play in the shift. But here's the issue, beloved. Christian perspective, the question isn't what is politically correct, but what is theologically correct. The question isn't what does the culture think, but the question is what does God know? Previous excesses in one direction do not excuse over correction in another direction. What we need, of course, is the truth going in both directions. It's a question of authority and obedience, and truth trumps good intentions. Listen carefully to this statement. Submission, like all of God's commands, the command to submit in whatever context, and we'll see multiple ones, but the command to submit, just like all of commands of God, is a privilege, not an imposition. It's a privilege, not an imposition. So to recapture this profoundly controversial word, over the next couple of weeks, we want to look at the privilege of submission, the principle, the purpose, and finally the power. I'm going to take the first two this week. We'll take the next two next week. So first of all, the privilege of submission. Verse 11 of our text, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. You recall, if you were with us, it's been a while now, but back when we looked at what is the purpose of First Timothy, he tells us in First Timothy 3.15, this is instruction, the whole book, on how one ought to behave in the household of God. So public worship is in view here. And frankly, to learn quiet submission applies to all of us, men and women alike. The primary reason that we come to church, if we're getting it right, is really twofold. It's to worship God and declare his worth, and secondly, it is to hear a word from God. If we're coming for any other primary reasons, we're coming for the wrong reasons. Fellowship is wonderful. Singing together is wonderful, but even the singing, if you'll notice, we're trying to learn through that because the Bible says we should sing to one another in hymns and songs and spiritual songs. In other words, we should be teaching one another through the music. 
And that's our intent, and that's our hope, and that's our purpose and what we do. But it's the hearing a word from God that is so important in why we come together. We must always examine what we're hearing to make sure it's right in light of the word. But first, we listen through with quietness and submission. Now, the word quietly means attentively, with a teachable spirit, not an argumentative one. So we start with that. If God says it, and we can defend that this is actually what God meant, then we must be teachable on this issue. And then submissively, what does that entail? Well, Paul uses here a word that is a form of the verb hupatasso, the Greek word hupatasso, hupa, under, tasso, to arrange. And so it's a word which means to arrange under. It's a military term which is used to speak of rank. It is the submission of one will to another. Just like in the military, when the sergeant says go, the private says okay. And when the general says go, the private says jump, the private says how high, right? I mean, this is the way it works. And that's exactly the word that Paul uses here. This is what submission is. Submission starts with submission to God and his commands. And then it extends however far we get those in the word of God. Now verse 12, if you look at it, clarifies Paul's instructions. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Now we see that to learn quietly in public worship means not to teach men, nor to exercise authority over men. So in public worship, women honor God by submission to the teaching and authority of the male leadership in the congregation. This is God's command. Now this is no different from the instruction that Paul, that, well, Paul possibly, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but that is found in Hebrews 13, 17. We read this, to all of the congregation, the writer of the Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit, same word, submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. That's written to both men and women. Men and women alike honor God by listening to and learning with a teachable spirit. Now back in 1 Timothy, does, does, does the words that are used there apply anything a little bit extra for women? And yes, it does. But only one thing, I believe. Both the phrase, if you look again at 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12, both the phrase to teach in verse 12, and to exercise authority. Both of those phrases are, do a little grammar here, they are present tense infinitives, which means they speak of ongoing action. We could translate those this way, to be a teacher or to be a leader in authority over the congregation. John MacArthur gives the, uh, gives the um the essence of what this means when he says this, he says, by using the present infinitive instead of the aorist, Paul does not forbid women to teach under appropriate conditions and circumstances, but to fill the office and the role of the pastor or teacher in the life of the church. That then is the one, I believe, the one restriction is that a woman is not to teach from a position of theological authority in a local church. Beyond that, there is freedom. Now, if you want to see how this is nailed down in another passage, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 4, Paul says this. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. 
You say, well, what is that all about? It sounds like a ritual of some kind. Well, it, it's really very simple. The culture in that time said that you showed submission by wearing a headdress in public. And this was what women were to do in church. This is a cultural mandate. That's why we don't say women need to wear head covers in church these days. This was cultural, but it was a temporary cultural uh, command in order to illustrate a permanent and ongoing universal truth. The head covering represented temporarily the submission which is permanent. Now, if you're in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, turn over to 1 Corinthians 14, and let's look beginning in verse 33. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. Please note the phrase. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak as authority, I would put in parens, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shameful thing for a woman to speak authoritatively, in church. Now that word shameful could be translated disgraceful. It's used in Ephesians 5:12 to speak of sexual immorality and that a Christian or anybody ought to be ashamed to be involved in those kind of things and how Paul lumps that into the the same uses the same word to say for a woman to speak in an authoritative way, in a preaching way, in a teaching way in a church congregation as an elder of that church is shameful. So the instruction, beloved, is clear. We can argue about it. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. But you really can't do anything about the instruction. It's simply here. And it means exactly what it says. The question is one of obedience. Will we submit ourselves to the Lord's goodness and grace in the commands that he has given us? You know, the attitude with which we do this so reflective of who we are. I, it, it reminds me of a story I, heard, I read about one time of Stonewall Jackson. The, you know, they're tearing his statues down now, but, uh, but he was a man who uh, fought and had uh, great uh, success in the Civil War for the southern side in the, in the war. One day he and three or four soldiers were out scouting out a, a, a battlefield. And they came across about 15 or 20 Union soldiers while they were doing that. Well, they surprised those guys, and they got the draw on them. So they took those 15 or 20 guys captive, brought them back through the Confederate lines. And as they were going through the Confederate lines, one of the Union soldiers who had been captured shouted out this way. He said, gentlemen, we have the honor of being captured by Stonewall Jackson. He actually considered it because Jackson's reputation was already so great that he considered it an honor to be captured by this man. And beloved, we as Christians have the honor of being captured by someone infinitely greater than that. We have been captured, if we are truly believers, by the Lord Jesus Christ, who promises in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What that means is when we obey his commandments, we will never regret it. But we will surely regret it if we don't. We'll not regret obeying him even if we don't fully understand. Submission, therefore, in the sense that it's in our passage, is a privileged gift from a loving Heavenly Father. So that's where we need to start with the privilege of submission. Now, secondly, we have the principle of submission. The principle of submission. God, who is the creator of all things, has established two great pillars. Two great pillars to, to define human relationships. Submission and authority. These are true, not just within the church. These are true 
of all kinds of relationships, the marriage relationship, where God has defined that the headship resides in the husband and the wife is the follower. These reside in government where God has defined that the governors lead and the people follow. It's defined in families where God has defined that parents lead and children follow. And it's defined in church where elders lead as servant leaders and where the congregation follows. When faithfully applied, these principles of submission and authority always bring peace and harmony and order. When they're abused on either side, and granted they can be abused on either side, when they are, they bring chaos. It's God's design. These are spiritual principles intended for our good, and the violations of them have consequences, just as surely as the violation of God's physical laws have consequences. You violate the law of gravity and you're in trouble, right? You can deny it, but you'll be in trouble. You'll be like the guy who jumped off the Empire State Building, you know? He's denying the law of gravity. He jumps off. He gets to the 20th floor and somebody hollers out, how's it going? He said, everything is great so far. Well, it is, isn't it? Because you can violate the principles for a while, but there is a, there's an accountability at the bottom. Do you see that? And it's the same with the spiritual commands that God gives us. Listen, the reason our society is in free fall right now, even as we speak, is because we have violated these principles over and over and over again in our desire to follow human wisdom and to be politically correct. There isn't any question about that. So is there a way back? Always there's a way back. What's the way back? The way back is always the same, repentance. The way back is to acknowledge that God was right and we were wrong. The way back is to get our lives together as those who believe in Christ. The way back is to get our families together, to get our marriages together, to get our churches together, to get society together, make sure we're doing our part to operate on the principles that God gives us. And so the principle of submission in the church we come to. And I want to look at this in two ways, what it means and then what it does not mean, because I think this will help flesh out how we should view this. What, first of all, what does it mean that women are to submit in this way? Well, we've already seen in the church both men and women are to submit to the elders. This is God's command in Hebrews 13, 17, as well as other places. For a woman, that submission extends one step further. And beloved, please understand, a woman can aspire to leadership as a deaconess. We'll see it in chapter 3. If you check out Romans 16, you'll find Paul re representing that office there. But she is prevented by God from one thing, and that is from the office of elder since that would give her authority over men. She has to defer to male leadership in the church. That doesn't mean that she'll agree with everything that goes on any more than a submissive wife agrees with her husband's decisions in a marriage. It doesn't mean that she can't have a voice any more than a submissive wife in a marriage can have and should have a voice. With a loving husband who should be listening and taking into account her opinions, as they are expressed, hopefully, in a quiet and dignified manner, most of the time. But in the end, obedience to God re requires deferring to local church leaders. Now, in the past 50 years, since 1969, there have been all kinds of attempts to circumvent this instruction so that the church could line up with society. Some say, how do they do this? Well, some say Paul was just wrong, that he was echoing the rabbinical prejudices of his day and of his time, and that therefore we should not pay attention to those. But do you see that as soon as you do that, you have now completely undermined the inerrancy of Scripture and the authority of Scripture? You just pulled the rug out right out from under it. And the moment you do that, everything's up for grabs. I can define away anything I want to. If we're going to take Scripture to be our authority, then we have no choice. The words are there. The words mean what we think they mean. 
Another attempt has been made by saying, well, Paul was just dealing as he wrote to Timothy, who was resident in Ephesus at the, at the time, he was just dealing with a, some kind of a problem in Ephesus, where they were having a problem with some, some, some kind of feminist supremacy that was going on there because the cult of Diana was, was housed there, this cult of a goddess in the Greek religion. And so that's what Paul was fighting against. Only three problems with that. The first problem is there's no evidence of a feminist problem in Ephesus. Yes, the cult of Diana was there, but it was run completely by male priests. Second problem is Paul didn't just give these instructions to Ephesus, to Timothy and Ephesus. As we've already seen, he gave them an even stronger language to Corinth. And in the one in Corinth, in verse 35, he said this applies to all the churches. So this was not a local issue that Paul was dealing with. And thirdly, as we will see, we haven't been there yet, but we'll see that Paul's reasons are universal. Paul's reasons go back to the original creation. They're not cultural and they're not local. And so we cannot say that. Other attempts to explain away what the Bible says here are equally weak. Every one of them that I have ever seen undermines the authority of Scripture. Every one of them, basically, if you believe it, you have to say, well, Scripture isn't true at this point. And as, you, as soon as you do that, you have lost your authority. The Bible, God's Word, clearly assigned to women the role of submission to male leadership in local churches. So that's what it means. It means what it says. What does it not mean? Two things that I want to stress to you that it does not mean. Number one, it does not mean inferiority. It does not mean that men are somehow superior to women or that women are inferior to men. It does not mean that. That issue was addressed clear back at the beginning in creation in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1.26, we find God saying, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, male and female, let them have dominion. They are therefore equally in the image of God. They are equally given the task to accomplish dominion on earth it's just that the order of creation established the man as the head in that relationship. And God reinforced that in chapter 2 of Genesis. In verse 24, where we have the first marriage, God instructs that a man... Do you ever wonder why he said that? He says, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. How come he didn't say the wife should leave home? Isn't usually the wife who leaves home. And the answer to that question is, he says, the man should leave because the man is taking the leadership. He's reinforcing the idea of the headship of the husband. Headship is further shown by the fact that Adam names the animals. Genesis 2.20. He names his own wife. Genesis 3.20. In case you think it's Old Testament, you find the same thing in the New Testament where Paul says in Ephesians 5.22, wives... Submit, same word, to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. So he's the head. But that doesn't mean he's superior, too. I mean, depending on what element of characterization you're talking about, he may not be. It could be the other way around. But they are equal in personhood. I think that's the important thing to see, and that's the thing we need to see. God created equality in personal worth, in personal dignity, but diversity in function. It's what you need to, if you're going to understand the Bible, this is, these are the, the, the words you need to know is diversity of function and diversity of role, R-O-L-E. These are very important. Equal, but different. It's not a question of worth or value, it's a question of roles. Now, I know some counter by saying, well, what about Galatians 3.28? If you don't know Galatians 3.28, here's what it says. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And some have pointed to that verse and said, okay, if there is neither male nor female, then we can't make distinctions between them when it comes to church government, when it comes to setting up homes or anything else. But the first thing you need to remember is, number one, Galatians was written long before Ephesians, where Paul talks about marriage, or 1 Timothy, where he talks about churches. And yet Paul makes clear distinctions, gender distinctions, in roles in both of those places. So whatever he means in Galatians, it can't mean that there's no distinction in function between male and, and, and female in these particular areas. But I think the bigger thing to note is that the context of Galatians 3, and we don't have time to turn to it, but check it when you get home. The context of Galatians 3 is talking about salvation. It's talking about salvation and, and that it's equally available to all. And Paul's point in Galatians 3.28 is that slaves are just as saved as free people. His point is that Gentiles are just as saved as Jews, which was sort of news to the Jews of Jesus' time. He's saying that females are just as saved as males. There's no distinction. They are spiritual equals. And when they came to faith, but, what, but when they came to faith in Christ, slaves didn't suddenly become physically free, nor did Gentiles suddenly become physically Jews nor did females suddenly become physically males. The distinctions hold from the standpoint of who they are. They're simply not there in terms of the, of the, of the value, the equality of, of all of them with regard to salvation. That's the point that Paul is making. Dr. Sosi writes it this way. He said, oneness in Christ did not obliterate the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. Nor did it remove the functional differences between slaves and masters. Why then should we assume that it did so between men and women? And the answer is we should not. The Bible teaches equality of personal worth, equality of spiritual standing for believers, but diversity of functions. And the principle of submission and authority as the two pillars of a successful relationship in whatever area of life you want to talk about, hold now, if you've written me off on everything I've said so far, please listen now. Because what I want to show you is that this same principle applies not just to human relationships. It applies within the Trinity itself. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 11. Maybe you're in 1 Corinthians. I guess I never got away from it. 1 Corinthians 11. It's a staggering passage of Scripture that we often overlook as to its implications. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Paul says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. So every man who has the tendency to be a tyrant or to be a dictator in whatever area of authority God has given him needs to, needs to wait and think, wait a minute, I'm going to stand before God and give an account. It isn't going to be very long before that happens. Better be getting my instructions from the right place because the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. But look at this. The head of Christ is God. God the Father. The head of Christ is God the Father. I mean, are you kidding me? There's diversity of function and diversity of role within the Godhead itself? Yes. That is exactly what this is teaching. Does that make Jesus any less God than the Father? Of course not. Jesus is equal in essence to the Father. He is equally God. He is equal, he is equally, his, his value and his worth is equal to the Father, but they have different roles. The Father is the initiator. The Son is the follower. We see this all the way through the earthly life of Christ. You read the book of John and you'll find over and over Jesus saying, I am, I'm just here to do the will of the one who sent me. I'm here to do the will of the Father. 
He says in, in John 4, verse 34, my food is to do the will of the Father, the thing that sustains me, the thing that keeps me going, the things that drives my life, is not to do my own will. It's not to find my own ease and comfort. It's not to defend my own rights. My food is to do the will of the Father. The authority of the Father, the submission of the Son. So what that means, beloved, is that when God is asking us to submit to the authorities in our lives, he's asking us to act like God. This is one of the primary ways that we represent God on earth. We submit to the authorities. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, Titus 3, we submit to the authorities that God is putting government over us, written when Nero was in charge. Until and unless they tell us that we have to sin. As wives, we submit to husbands. As children, we submit to parents. And as those who are in a congregation, we submit to the leaders who are there because in every single case, we not only make it better for ourselves, we always will, but we represent God correctly. This principle doesn't just go back to creation. This principle goes into eternity in the case of God. So it does not imply inferiority. Second thing that submission does not mean, it does not mean no teaching for a woman. It doesn't mean that. Now look again, if you're back in 1 Timothy, at uh, chapter 2 and, and verse 11, Paul says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach. Well, does that mean absolutely? A woman can't ever teach? No. Read on. The sentence didn't stop there. She is not to teach or exercise authority over a man. So that begins to clarify. She's not prohibited from teaching absolutely, but only in a capacity that implies authority over a man. The second clause limits the restriction of the first clause, and it limits the, the, it, it limits the restriction to teaching, to teaching in an official capacity as a church elder, a teaching pastor, a preaching pastor. You say, should women not be pastors? No. Read the Bible. Does that mean they're all condemned? No. But beloved, if we're going to follow the dictates of Scripture, this is what it says. That's the limitation. Women to remain quiet in the sense of not seeking that role. But there is much opportunity beyond that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. If you're in 1 Timothy, just turn over there. Chapter 3, verse 14 of 2 Timothy. Paul reminds Timothy. He says, Continue in the things that you learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it in the sacred writings of verse 15. Well, where did Timothy get that instruction? Well, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 5 of 2 Timothy, you'll find out he got that instruction from his grandmother, Lois, and from his mother, Eunice. To women. That's where he got his instruction. So teaching children is a great opportunity. We have some wonderful women teaching in our Sunday school. Some wonderful women who have taught in the Good News Clubs in the, in, uh, at home. Some great women who are teaching at the Northern Colorado Christian Academy. Opportunities for teaching are everywhere. And it certainly starts with children. The, you know what the greatest mission field we have as a church and that, we ha and that you have as a family? It's your kids. Start there. Let our children have the gospel so they can come to faith in Christ. But it doesn't stop there. We also have some other things going on. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 3, look what it says. Older women means the more mature Likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach. Same word that is restricted in 
1 Timothy 2, they are to teach what is good and so train the young women. So here we have women commanded to teach other women. And I think this extends, as I'll show you in a moment, to privileged settings where the official church authority is not the issue. For example, and by the way, we have some sessions going on or have had until we see how the COVID thing goes, but some older women, more mature women, teaching younger women. This is exactly what the Bible tells us to do. We also find that there's some occasions when it's not in an official church capacity. In, in Acts chapter 18, there's a guy that comes as an evangelist to Ephesus. His name is Apollos. Church has already been established in Ephesus. He comes from Alexandria. He's an extremely talented man. A great orator and a, and a great learner, and no wonder, coming from Alexandria, where they had one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world, he knew all about the ancient writers. He, he was well-versed in all things, except he wasn't all that well-versed in, 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 in New Testament theology yet, because he just hadn't been around it that much. And so look at, at Acts 18, verse 26. We didn't turn there, but let me read it for you. It says that he, Paulus, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla... Christian lady who was there and her husband Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So here we have Priscilla, a woman, teaching Apollos, a man, in a non-church setting. They took him aside privately and she taught him. I think this could correspond in our day to private teaching, small groups, Bible studies, where the authority of elders, that are under the authority of elders, where women could question and share their knowledge with others most appropriately. All that is really excluded is the position of elder or teaching pastor. Well, God has committed, used committed women in many powerful ways in Scripture. Remember the story of Esther, of Deborah, of Ruth, Mary, many others. Lots of room for useful service for women with this one restriction. But I think when God draws the line at church leadership, we must obey. Submission is not punishment, beloved. Submission is privilege. A few years ago, they had a, they had a big flood in um, Leicester, England, required the rescue of a bunch of people who had driven their cars, you know, into flooded areas. Same thing that happens every time it floods, but I just happened to read this account, so I'm, I'm using it. But the excuses are, are, are amazing. One guy said he forgot he was driving his van and thought he was piloting his boat. I don't know whether he was really serious when he said that, but that was the excuse that came. But most of them said this, and this caused the... Uh, the local fire, uh, flood warden to tweet this. He said, I sometimes think, why do I bother advising drivers when they think I know better? I can't think of a better description of human wisdom. When we think we know better than God and we want to put his commands aside, his clear commands, we must remember he knows better. He not only knows better for us, but he knows better for society. He knows better for culture. He knows what's going to work best. Cultures can't flourish if they disobey the commands of God. People cannot be fruitful if they disobey the commands of God. So we need to remember when, wherever God has put us is a gift. Whatever he commands to us is a privilege. And it's easy to remember when you remember Jesus' words about his kingdom when he says the first will be last and last will be first. So that's the start. Next week we'll finish up. Please come back. Look forward to seeing you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the graciousness of yourself. We thank you that every sin of our heart, soul, mind, and body, and thoughts has been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ if we will just accept it. And so I pray that as we look at our own lives, we will also look at you who obeyed the Father all the way to the cross. Because what came out of that? The salvation of mankind. 
And so you're never asking us to do something that you won't make something great out of. And I pray that we'll see it that way and that we will experience it that way. That from the bottom of our hearts, we'll find it a privilege and a pleasure to obey you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand. I pray that the attitude of our heart would truly be this, that it is our joy to honor you by obedience. You've said if you love me, obey my commandments. You will obey my commandments. So would, we, would you help us do that? And Father, today, I just want to lift up, as we've seen these pictures of the hospital there in Bangladesh, where Teresa is ministering so faithfully, this young, young lady, um, where, the, where, the, where the COVID virus has now arrived and is spreading rapidly, where the hospital was already full before all of this happened, where the work was already overwhelming, and so it's only more so. Lord, bless them, bring healing, bring your spirit of encouragement, help, Father, that you would protect those who are working there. Pray that the message of those who serve, because most of them are Christians, read the message of the gospel where they're allowed to preach it only because they're really bringing the medical help, pray that it will be effective. Lord, we pray that many will come to know you as a result of having something bad happen to them. And out of it, you brought them to salvation. What a wonderful thing that would be. So bless us as we go. Help us to be a week that we are productive in your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. See you next week. Thank you.